Let's read the first three verses of Acts 13. We're going to look at the whole chapter. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mananian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they worshipped the Lord and uh, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The church at Antioch was not content to add to their numbers. Their desire was to send their numbers out with the gospel. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that, especially in the context of how we, and I'm talking we as those who are already Jesus followers, we as those who have church experience, I want you to think about that in the sense of how we tend to measure success. As local churches, we tend to measure success by buildings, budgets, and bums in the seat. And if our numbers are growing, we're successful. But the book of Acts paints a different picture. It really, especially with this this church, Antioch, this exemplary church, Antioch, it paints a picture of a church catching Jesus' vision for his church and wanting to send out. And I love the fact that Luke records quite clearly it's the Holy Spirit who's initiating this It's the Holy Spirit who's leading this whole process. This is where they're at. And I think it's important for us to recognize that Luke does intend the book of Acts to answer questions like, how did Jewish apostles following a Jewish Messiah end up converting so many Gentiles? That's one of the questions that's going to be answered beginning in this chapter. But also he wants to answer questions like, how is it that Paul, the apostle Paul's influence became as strong as the Apostle Peter's influence. He's answering that question for his readers as well. And we're going to see some of that starting in this chapter as well. But more than that, this is, the Holy Spirit wants to show us that Jesus is continuing his mission through his church. That he's still working this way. So if we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be those who are filled with his spirit, then our church needs to line up this way. And so what we want to look at this morning is three truths about this mission that Jesus gives his church. Here's the first one in verses 1 to 12. Mission requires the intentionality of God's people. Mission never happens by accident. It requires the intentionality of God's people. In verses 1 to 3, which we just read, we see that the Antioch church sent out as the Spirit led them to send out. And and it names names these prophets and teachers. And we, this this could be that they were, all five of these men were both prophets and teachers, or it could be that just a group of some prophets, some teachers. I, I prefer the former. I think that's probably what's going on. But we don't want to get a picture of just these five men coming together. We know from the end of chapter 14 when Paul and his companions come back to Antioch, that they give a test, they give a, a sort of a, an update to the whole church. So the implication in this section is it's the whole church sending them out, but this church is being led by a diverse group of spirit-filled men. And it's, what's interesting about this group, it's not just that they have potentially diverse gifts, it's also, listen, that they, they are men of different standing. You have Barnabas, who who was a a Jew, but who grew up in a Hellenistic society, that is a Greek culture. So he was a Jew by birth, but he was Greek by culture. He became a Jesus follower. We have, uh, it mentions uh, these men here, uh, Simeon, who's called Niger, which means, literally means the black man. And Lucius of Cyrene, which is an area of northern Africa. These could have possibly been the first uh, African or black missionaries sent out. Not people who went to Africa to send out, but missionaries going out from Africa. Then you have this man who's, who's mentioned here, um, 
Mannion, who happens to be a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. In other words, he grew up in the upper crust of society, the political elite, whereas the rest of these guys were probably more common men. And of course, Saul, who's, who knows Paul, which we continue to learn lots about him. The point is, God's using this diverse group of spirit-filled men to lead a congregation in corporate worship. And we don't know if this was a special meeting or if they were just, just what they did, what they did when they gathered together as the Anak church, they just sought the Lord in worship. Now, don't think of worship just as worship in song. That's part of it. But think of it as hearing the words. There's a, there's a good sense of, of this description would fit what we read in 1 Corinthians 14, where you have a, a, a few people teaching or maybe a few people prophesying and then teachers kind of explaining what was prophesied and how that fits with the Old Testament, that sort of a thing. But they have this service where there's instruction and there's sung worship and there's one anothering going on. And as they do this, it says specifically in verse 2 that the Holy Spirit speaks. And he says something specifically. It says in verse 2 that he says, the Holy Spirit says, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have, notice past tense, called them. Again, Luke doesn't tell us exactly how this happened. I think the mention of the fact these guys were prophets, somebody had a specific prophetic word that God spoke through one of these guys. But what probably happened here is there's a specific uh, prophetic word which is actually confirming a calling that Barnabas and Saul had. I'll be really honest, and this is maybe just me being maybe too cautious, I don't know, but I'm always a little bit suspicious when someone says, I have a word from God for you, and that word has nothing to do with anything I've ever thought about before. Because I really trust the Holy Spirit's going to prepare me for what he wants me to do, for where, how he wants to direct me. And that can be confirmed by a prophetic word. And so I, I kind of think this is maybe what's happening. But it's also important for us to recognize that after the Holy Spirit speaks so clearly, what did the church do? In verse 3 it says, Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So if this is indeed the whole church doing this, I want you to think about this, that you have a situation where they know what God wants, send these guys out to the mission I have for them, and they continue to seek God. I mean, when you're fasting, you're kind of giving up something to gain something else. You're saying, I'm going to give up food or a habit so I can gain God's direction. And fasting should be something that's kind of in the normal rhythms of our life might look different for each one of us, but it still should be something, as Jesus followers, it's there. Not just fasting so like, you know, like, it's very popular now, this intermittent fasting, you know, you know I'm not going to eat until 1 p.m. And that's not about seeking God, it's about trying to get abs again. Give it up, middle-aged men, you ain't going to get abs again, all right? But, but this is kind of, this can be popular, but this is not what it is. It's, this is like, I, I'm willing to, I, I want God's help. I need God's help so much, I'm going to give up food or something else, so I can just seek after him. The whole church was doing that. Why? Because they knew as senders, as those who send out missionaries, they were as, just as dependent as the missionaries themselves for, for mission success. They needed God to do this. This is why we try to assign one of the missionaries or slash ministries that we support to a house group, and the house group should regularly pray for that. Lord, what are you doing here? Now, we probably are less consistent about that than we should be, but that's part of it. Lord, we recognize if we're going to send them, if our sending them is about supporting them, about wanting to see them succeed, we need you to move us to pray. So Antioch Church sends, sent as the Spirit led. Now, also, listen, this is, this is one of the things that we should be wanting when we gather together. God, would you, would you prepare us to, to be able to minister to one another, to hear from you and minister to one another so that we can stay on mission. This is, this is the, an, a, 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 sort of a, a, an undergirding principle through everything that we read in the New Testament. This sense of mission is there. And so when you read these verses in Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from the New Living Translation just to hear them afresh, but you need to think about this in a missional context. Let us, the writer says, think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I want you to think about those, those verses in, the, in light of mission. 
Jesus is coming back soon, sooner now than when he wrote this. And we want to bring as many people to heaven with us as possible. So we need to be thinking about mission and how we can encourage each other, support each other, stir each other up towards mission. That should be part of our gathering. But also listen, speaking of intentionality, Paul and Barnabas actually go as the Lord called them. Look at verse 8, or I'm sorry, verse 4. In verse 4 it says, And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went out to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they, pro, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues, gone through the whole island as far as Paphos. They came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named bar Jesus. Now, n- next week, I promise to have a map for you so you can see where this is happening. I forgot to do that, sorry. Uh, but also, I w- I, before we talk about this guy, Bar Jesus, I want you guys to recognize something, okay? What they're doing is, as they go to this place, they go to this island uh, 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 of Cyprus, when they get to Cyprus, what they do is they go into the Jewish synagogues and they preach Jesus from the Old Testament scriptures. And then that preaching of Jesus from the Old Testament scriptures is what leads to further gospel conversations. Now, I want to be clear that though that has a specific application for that day, in other words, I'm not encouraging us to go to Judas synagogues and preach Jesus. First of all, they might welcome you in, they might not, but if you start preaching Jesus, they're definitely going to ask you to leave, (laughs) okay? But what I am saying is this, we are gathered together as God's people To hear about Jesus from the scriptures, why? To equip us for further gospel conversations. That's what's meant to happen. And so what they experience, though, is they have this guy that that comes up, this guy named Bar Jesus. And and here's what we know about him. Look at what it says in verse 7. It says that this guy was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who had summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, it just basically means like wise one, uh, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So what happens? Barnabas and Saul, as they, as they go as the Lord calls them, they're engaging with someone who's antagonistic against the gospel. He wants to keep people from believing the gospel. At the same time, as engaging with someone who's open to the gospel. That's complicated, isn't it? It's tricky. How do we do that? How do you, if you have these guys that are buddies hanging out, one hates the the idea of Jesus, the other one's open to the idea of Jesus, that's a tricky thing to navigate. But but here's the thing, this is what we should expect. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says, speaking of his ministry when he's writing to to the Corinthians, he says, there's a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. This is what we should expect on mission. Just as Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas experienced, we should expect God's going to open doors for us, and at the same time, there's going to be opposition. It's not going to be easy. Have you ever heard those stories of, of people who, they just feel like the Holy Spirit said, go get milk, and so they go to the store and buy milk, and there's someone there who, who uh, there's no one there, so they buy the milk, and then they say, the Holy Spirit led me to this address. Go to this address and hand people the milk, and you out the door, and someone cries, oh, I was praying for milk, and like, oh, it's beautiful. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, I'm not saying God didn't do that, but we hear that and we go, yeah, Lord, make mission like that. Radically, supernatural, spontaneous, and everyone's just so glad that we came. But that's not always how ministry is. Often it's like, oh, there's an open door here, but this other guy really hates me at the same time. And this is what these guys are experiencing. And so what happens With this intentionality that they go out, we see now that in verse 9 that Paul's going to have to confront. He's going to have to confront the guy who's antagonistic because the gospel commands it. Look at verse 9. It says, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop the crooked, making crooked, the straight paths of the Lord. Now, now what's happening here is, listen, there needs to be an understanding for us, if we're going to be intentional about the gospel, that a counterfeit is not just someone who believes something false. Anyone who's not a Christian believes something false. If you're not a believer yet in Jesus, this is not me trying to be offensive, but the truth is you believe things that aren't true. According to Christianity, you believe things that aren't true. I mean, you probably expect that, I would think, that if you're not a Christian and we're saying Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and you don't believe in Jesus, 
we're saying you believe something that's not true. So hopefully that doesn't surprise you and hopefully you're not uh, offended by that. So I'm not talking about someone who believes something that's not true, but a counterfeit is the person who not only doesn't believe something that's not true, but wants to keep you or someone else from believing the truth. That's the idea here. And a counterfeit who has that goal to keep people from the real Jesus must be confronted when they're interfering with the mission that God's given you. So, so you say, how does that work? Let's, let's say at work you have a friend Adam and a friend Bob, A and B. Your friend Adam seems to be open to the gospel. He, he knows you're a Christian. He asks you questions about your weekend. He likes to hear about what, what you did at church and that so on and so forth. Bob thinks you're nuts. He thinks you're just a complete idiot. In fact, what you find out is Bob actually is a Jehovah's Witness. So he's not going to affirm anything that you say, but is openly, when you have a discussion with Adam, he openly goes to Adam and undermines what you say. That's tricky, that's tricky isn't it? Because you don't want to cause problems at work. You don't want to risk your job unnecessarily. So how do you deal with that? First of all, you pray. But you say, God, you need to give me wisdom on this. And it may mean that you have to take Bob out to lunch and say, Bob, look, I want to lovingly say to you, if you want to have your conversations with Adam, that's fine. But uh, uh, you and I know we don't agree on this. So when you privately go behind and undermine, you've got to ask yourself, what's the deal? And if you want to talk about what's real and what's true, let's talk about what's real and what's true. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. I'm not trying to pick on JWs. I'm just saying this is an example I could think of. The, the point is, listen... That counterfeits have to be confronted. In fact, really what Paul's saying here is, look, you're not a son of Jesus. His name was Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus. You're not a son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil. He says, you're, you're, not, a, you're not a prophet of God. He says it's a false prophet. He said, listen, you're a perverter of the truth. Now, I'm not saying we should be this pointed. Now, these guys are being this pointed because they're in a public setting when this needed to be done. They're being publicly uh, um, in, a, in a place where there's open dialogue, they're being publicly confronted, so they're confronting back. But what I'm saying is, if we let lies go, people will assume we don't think they're lies. So we can't do that. Also, let me say this as well. There's a difference between lies that undermine the gospel and issues that gospel-believing Christians disagree on. We have to be careful with this, people. People can believe in the real Jesus and the real gospel and disagree about sort of how the end times works or disagree about the place of the, the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or whether baptism should be as a child sprinkled on or as an adult believer immersed. We can disagree on some of those things, okay? And we don't need to divide, especially on Facebook. My goodness, but what I'm talking about is when you're engaged in mission and you, you see the enemy coming in through someone who wants to just undermine the faith that you, that you see God developing in someone else, there needs to be some kind of confrontation. Now, in verse 11, what does he do? It says in verse 11, Paul says, and now, he says to this, this false prophet, he says, now behold, the, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to, to see the sun for a time. And immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Man. Now, God's probably not going to give you that power. Don't get excited. Someone, yeah, that would, it could be kind of nice, let's be honest. You know? I wouldn't want to blind the person. I just want to stop their mouth. You know, like, and the Lord will now shut you up. That would be great. I'm sure people have prayed that for me. But, but the thing is, what God's doing here is interesting. Is Remember, what happened to Saul when he was persecuting the church? Jesus knocks him off his high horse, says, you are persecuting me. And then what does Jesus do to Paul? Blinds him. He's blinded by the glory of God. And it's interesting, Luke uses some of the same language to say how Paul groped about. Now we have this false prophet groping about. This is not to give us maybe any hint that, 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 that what, what the final outcome was with this false prophet. But it is to show that, that God's intent by doing this severe judging kind of miracle was to get this guy's attention. It was to show him, listen, you are spiritually blind and so I'm gonna physically blind you temporarily so that you might realize where you're off. God was doing that. Now what's interesting here too 
It says in verse 12 that, that Sergio Paulus, this, this proconsul, it says, verse, then he believed. The proconsul believed. And when he saw what he had, when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? So he's hearing the gospel preached. This false prophet comes and says, nah, it's bogus, bogus. Don't listen to those guys. I'm the, I'm the powerful magician here. You should listen to me. Now, you know what? This might sound familiar to you because remember, Peter was in the same situation in Acts chapter 8. Peter had a, a, another false prophet or magician trying to keep people from believing the truth. And Peter had to come against that guy in a very strong way. So this is, again, Luke trying to say, this is how Paul is doing the same kind of works that Peter does. This is why they got that same kind of uh, authority. But also what's interesting about this is this guy's heard God's teaching and, and, and he's getting convinced, man, I think Jesus is real. I think Jesus is the one I need to believe in. And when this false prophet comes here and he gets, he gets not just confronted, but a supernatural miracle happens to blind the guy, he goes, okay, that's the one I gotta believe. I gotta believe these guys who are preaching Jesus. What happens here, really, is he believes through a supernatural confirmation of the truth. Now, the ending of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16, verse 20, is in debate. It is a really legitimate debate of whether or not this is part of the original Mark's gospel. So it's in most of our Bibles, but usually with the footnote saying it's not in a lot of manuscripts. So the reason I'm quoting, saying that is because I want you to know I'm quoting this more because even if this isn't in the original, it's definitely happening in the book of Acts. It says, and they went out, the apostles went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. We definitely see this happening in the book of Acts. And sometimes, guys, when God's done the, the few miracles in my 37 years of being a Christian, the few times God's done the miraculous through me and through my prayers was to confirm his word. But the reality is this. If we're gonna be involved in mission, we're all going to have to be intentional. We're all going to have to do it on purpose. If you're waiting for God to sort of say, go get a gallon of milk, before you do anything missional, you're never going to do anything missional. It's not going to happen. If you're waiting until there's an outreach event before you ever engage with unbelievers, what will probably happen is you won't use the outreach event to engage with unbelievers. There's got to be in us a heart that Jesus has of being intentional about reaching people. So that's the first thing about mission. The second thing is this. Mission happens through the proclamation of God's Son. Mission happens through the proclamation of God's Son. Look at verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now this is John Mark. This, that little tidbit will be important but when we get to chapter 15, so we'll just hold it there. Verse 14. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. Now, here's what we see happening, okay? They're going, Paul and company are going where the gospel is scarce. They're going to a place where people don't hear the gospel. One of the things that you that identifies a dodgy group, whether they're cultic in their practice or they're just, um, they're just a little bit dodgy in their practice, is that they never pursue unchurched people. They always go to where church people are. This is why we're, we're, we're sensitive. There was a guy, a couple guys actually, would, used to come to the church about every two years and these guys were universalists. And if you don't know what universalism, you can come talk to me about it. But it's a false doctrine. And they would come with this false doctrine and they'd come and they'd, and they'd kind of talk to people. And, and this is a doctrine that's very attractive and it's a doctrine that you can understand why people believe it, but it is a false doctrine. And I talk to people, and I have to go to them and say, look, guys, you guys are welcome to be here, but you're not welcome to spread that. Oh, no, we weren't mean to. So people just ask those questions, like, yeah, but seriously, you cannot do that. They'd say, no problem. They'd stop talking about it. They'd leave after service. You wouldn't see them again for two years, and they came back again. I think the third time they came, I said, listen, I saw men at the door and said, if you're going to share any of your false doctrine, you are not welcome in these doors. Do you understand? And they turned around and left. Haven't seen them since. Now, that might sound harsh. Josh, that's mean, John. But these guys were coming to pray, P-R-E-Y, on you. And we're not shepherding the flock unless we're protecting them from wolves. And so you have a situation where these guys are going where the gospel is scarce. They're not just trying to go to some church and poach some sheep. They're trying to go where the gospel is scarce. And so they go into the synagogues. Look at verse 14 again. It says, 
And they, on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. And after reading from the law and the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. Now, they probably are inviting these guys to speak, possibly because Paul looked like a rabbi. He probably wore the, the, this, the right kind of, kind of clothes that would identify him as a teacher of the law. And so this was common practice in synagogues as someone came in and it'd be, maybe it'd be like someone comes in, they have a dog collar and I say, oh, would you like to lead us in prayer? I probably wouldn't do that to be honest because I wouldn't want to know them first. But you know, it's kind of that kind of a thing. And, and so the thing is, they come in and they have, a dog collar means, I should say, Church of England. You guys know a dog. Yeah, okay. Making sure. <laughs> so, so, well, you just never know. Someone's, <laughs> someone's thinking, why would they wear a dog collar to church? <laughs> Sorry. But they ask, they ask him to teach. What's happening? Paul and his companions are looking for opportunities to share. They're going where the gospel is scarce. And when there's a chance to speak, what, what are they doing? They share. They speak. And you get a sense that they're prepared for this. They're prepared for this. I hope you guys recognize that the whole reason we do a Sunday gathering, not the whole reason, one of the main reasons we do a Sunday gathering, definitely the reason we teach verse by verse through whole books of the Bible, and we take the time to apply it to your lives, is that this is meant to equip you for the work of the ministry. This is the ministry I'm ministering to you right now, or another brother who's teaching will minister to you, to you now, but the purpose is to equip you for the work of the ministry, specifically the ministry of mission. That's why we do this. We have to be prepared to do this. If you're going to be involved in the mission, you need to prepare your hearts for this. Especially when we get down to this next section from verses 16 to 41, the biggest section, take probably the, a bulk of the time, where Paul is going to proclaim this unchangeable gospel. I want you guys, as we look at this, to think about, could I share any part of this gospel this way? Am I ready to share Jesus with people? Ask yourself that. And if you're new to the Christian faith, if you're still kind of checking this Jesus stuff out, I want you to recognize what Paul shares is exactly what you need to know. So let's pick it up, verse 16. It says this. So Paul stood up and he motioned with his hand. And he said, men of Israel and you who fear God, this is important, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So in this in these four verses, Paul's, first of all, intentionally addressing both Jews and Gentiles. When he says men of Israel and those who fear God, men of Israel being Jews, those who fear God being Gentiles who are listening in. He's purposely saying I, everyone needs to hear this message. This is important. But also, listen, he's summarizing several centuries of Israel's history in four verses. So if you don't know Israel's history, you might be a little bit lost here. Just Believe me, he's summarizing their history. If you want to know some of the questions afterwards, I'll tell you afterwards. But this is what he's doing. So then what do we see in verse 21? Then he says, Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. He says, of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before, he, before coming, his coming, John, that's John the Baptist, had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So what Paul's doing in the sermon, listen, Paul is basically emphasizing that Israel had desired a king and God chose who that king was, would be. First, he chose Saul. Saul failed. Then he chose David, a man after his own heart. And he promised David that from his line would come a king who would sit on the throne of Israel forever. That 
the familiar as Jesus. What he's talking about here is this, okay? He's talking about that God has prepared his people for Jesus. The whole Old Testament testifies of that. God's prepared his people for Jesus. That's the main point. And he includes John the Baptist in that list of Old Testament preparations. The reason this is important is that we don't serve or we don't follow. If you're a Jesus follower, you're not following a religion that's 2,000 years old. You're following a religion that goes back to the beginning of time. How God's beginning to a people and how God started with those people and built them into Israel and then from Israel brought the promised Messiah, Jesus, and then we follow the promised Messiah, Jesus. It's important that we recognize this. God prepares his people for Jesus. This is part of the unchangeable gospel. Look at verse 26. Brothers, son of the family of Abraham, and those uh, uh, among you who fear God, there he is addressing both parties, he says to us, has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets which were read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. In other words, they didn't understand the, the, the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, but they fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures by actually crucifying Jesus. He says in verse 28, And though they found him in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. Now what Paul's doing here is he's explaining that God is clear that the blindness of the Jews led them to partner with Rome and crucify Jesus and fulfill the scriptures. That God even used their sin to fulfill his plan. That's what we call mercy. Verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, Jesus appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring with you the good news that God promised his fathers this He has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus just as it is written in the second psalm. Now he quotes Psalm 2, 7 that says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And the reason he quotes this is because he's saying, look, the psalm predicted that the Messiah would be God's son and that God's son would prove himself. And Paul's connecting that to the resurrection. What he's saying is not that Jesus became God's son at the resurrection, but Jesus was proven to be God's son through the resurrection. You guys following me? Verse 34, And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure mercies of David. Here he's uh, uh, quoting Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3. And he's telling the people of Israel in Isaiah 55 that God made a promise to Israel And because he made a promise to David, and because he made a promise to David, he will keep that promise to the benefit of Israel. Verse 35. Therefore, he says, in another psalm, he quotes Psalm 1610 here, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Then he explains it in verse 36. He explains what the psalm means. Listen to this. For David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep, that is, he died, and he laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. In other words, what he says is this. Listen. That this this promise in Psalm chapter 16 can't apply to David. You You can read that psalm and go, oh, David was talking about himself. But David experienced corruption. His body corrupted. He died and his body rotted. That's the point. But Jesus didn't see corruption. He died, and three days later, before the body actually begins to really corrupt, he was resurrected, never to die again. The the point is this, listen. The point is, Paul, in preaching the unchangeable gospel, is saying God has provided everything he's promised in Jesus. He provides everything in Jesus. And this is not just substantiated by the historical reality of the resurrection, but the fact that that historical reality was predicted over and over in Scripture. I want you to think about this. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene, his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection were predicted. 
and all that God has promised the nation of Israel to bless the whole world comes to pass in Jesus. This is historical reality. Paul's preaching to this, these synagogue leaders, both the, the synagogue people, both the Jews and the Gentiles that are there, that God provides everything in Jesus. Then we get to this last bit, verses 38 to, to 41. And we see God clarifying both our choices and the consequences of those choices regarding Jesus. In verse 38, what does he say? I'll read it again. In verse 38, he says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, that's the resurrected Jesus, Forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything which they could not be freed by the law of Moses. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if you would trust Jesus, then you're going to experience the forgiveness and freedom from sin. Now, some of you might be here today going, I really don't care that much about sin. Why is that such a big deal? What is, it, what, is it, what, what is sin? Anyway, I know I do some bad stuff. I'm not perfect, but what's the big deal? Here's what you need, need to understand. When we talk about injustice, when we talk about all the things that we hate, that when we talk about the corruption we see in government or the corruption we see in corporate uh, entities or, or the, just the failure we see of leaders, when we see the corruption in the church, it's not just like, uh, you know, fringe churches or other churches that, you know, we, for years Protestants would say, look at how corrupt the Catholic church is. Man, Protestants were just as bad. There's corruption all over the place. When we see that, we go, ah, what is the deal? That's not just sin. That's actually, listen, that's actually the fruit of sin. Because sin is, our, is, is a position that we hold naturally. It's a position that we hold where we are against God and we don't want anything to do with his rule over our lives. That's sin. And the fruit of that is all this injustice in the church and out of the church. And what Paul is preaching to these Jewish leaders is, listen, he's preaching to this, these Jewish, this Jewish and Greek audience, he's saying to them, listen, Jesus frees us from both the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Which means that not only do we have forgiveness, for the sins that we've done, how we've added to that pot of, of rebellion that it is in this world. But also, listen, we can have freedom. You don't have to continue in that path anymore. And one day we'll be free from the very presence of sin. That, 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 that Jesus will come back and make this world the way it's supposed to be. That is our hope. This is what's promised through his death and resurrection. So this is part of our choice and consequences. If we will trust Jesus, then we will experience freedom or forgiveness. But here's the other option, verse 40. Beware, therefore, Paul says, that what is said in the prophets should come uh, uh, about. Look, he's quoting now uh, Micah. He says, look, you scoffers, and be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your day a work that you will not believe even if one tells you. In other words, what Paul's saying is if instead of trusting Jesus, you scoff at the gospel of Jesus, then your sin remains with you forever. Hell is not where the party is. Hell is where the party stops. Hell is when we still live with the consequences of sin. We are eternally sinful. And so, are, so is everyone else there including the devil and his angels. There's no hierarchy in there, in hell. Everyone's suffering, and it's horrible. And Jesus died to deliver us from it. Nobody has to go to hell if they'll respond to the gospel. This is important. It's important that we recognize, listen, that Paul's message here, he's preaching this unchangeable gospel if this message sounds familiar to you, especially if you've been going with us uh, through the book of Acts, it should sound familiar to you because it parallels the other sermons we've already read in the book of Acts. Because the gospel in the book of Acts, the gospel that Peter preached, that Paul preached, that Stephen preached, is all the same life-changing gospel, and that gospel hasn't changed. 
And to be in mission, to say, Jesus, I want to join you in mission. To do that as a church collectively and to do that as individuals within the church, uh, bringing that mission out, to do that, we, we have to be about proclaiming this gospel. And if we won't preach this gospel, then we're not fulfilling the mission of Jesus. We might be growing our church. We're not fulfilling the mission of Jesus. Listen. In Acts chapter 4, Peter said this, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I know that in our generation, we hate this kind of exclusivity, but no, this is your freedom. Until you recognize, until we recognize that there is salvation nowhere else but in Jesus, we won't be joining him in mission. Paul would come to, to write this in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He would say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He wrote what he practiced here that we're reading in Acts 13. He later on would write this in Galatians chapter 1. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That means damned. In other words, he's saying, I'm not the authority. The gospel we preach is the authority, and it's the non-negotiable gospel. It's the unchanging gospel, and it's the gospel that we have to proclaim if we're actually going to be involved in mission. Now, I'm not naive, guys. I've been doing this for a long time. I know not only is this really hard for us to do, but it takes a lot of practice and time to do this well, to share this truth well. But this is why we train the elders of this church to know how to handle God's word right so you can hear God's word and be equipped so that you can be involved in ministry. Because we're meant to be on mission together. And when we stand before God face to face, he's not gonna say to any of us, hey, how big was your church? Hey, did you ever get that building paid off? He's gonna say to us, what did you do with the gospel? Did you believe me enough to join me in ministry? And he's going to know the answer to that. I'm not trying to scare us. I'm trying to get us to see that this is what really makes our gatherings worth gathering, is to be joining Jesus in mission. Quickly, let me just do these last few verses. Because here's the last point. Mission should motivate us. It should motivate the perseverance of God's children. Look at verse 42 quickly. Verse 42, it says, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, they went out, the people, as they went out, as they, as they leave the synagogue, after, after Paul preaches this, the people begged that these might be told, told to, these, that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. Man, I've never, ever had anyone come to me after service say, oh man, you gotta teach that message again. How about next week? Never. But they're saying that to Paul. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. In other words, they're so moved by the gospel. There's a sense here that these people are being converted to the gospel, to Jesus. And as they followed them, who, as they spoke with them, Paul and Barnabas urged them to continue in the grace of God. In other words, here's what's happening. Paul and Barnabas call these new believers to abide in grace. You know what grace is? God's grace is his undeserved favor and his supernatural, uh, uh, supernatural enabling that has been merited or earned for us only through the person and work of Jesus. In other words, every good thing, our very forgiveness, our very salvation, the fact that we have a standing before God is a free gift from God. And even the power to live the life that God calls us to is a free gift of God. It's grace. It's grace. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us freely. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Romans that where our sin abounds, God grace abounds much more. It's grace. He tells them you need to abide in this grace. You need to stay in this grace. Grace is why we know that we are loved by God. We're not loved by God because we're getting it right. We're loved by God because he's a God of grace, because the gospel is of grace. This is behind the thinking of what Jude writes in Jude chapter uh, well, there's only one chapter in Jude. In Jude 1, verses 20 and 20, 21, he says, But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. That's the gospel. And praying in the Holy Spirit, 
Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. When he says keep yourself in the love of God, he's not saying keep yourself lovable. He's going stay in that place where you know that you know that you know that you're loved by God because of grace. Because only abiding in there do you have any strength to persevere. Verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. That's never happened to me either. <laughs> but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be first spoken to you. And since you thrust it aside, notice, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. And then he quotes this, another section from Isaiah, and he says, I have made a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. In other words, he, he, here's what Paul does. Paul, Paul and Barnabas said, we're going to prioritize those who want to hear the gospel, those who are actually interested in the gospel. What we see from verse 46 is that individuals, we as individuals, are all personally responsible for rejecting God's gift in Jesus. Now, again, I'm not trying to be too heavy-handed. I'm not trying to scare anyone here who's just investigating Christianity. But here's the reality. If you have not decided, you've decided not there is a reality that you're accountable for what you keep hearing. I don't say that to be harsh. We're really glad that there are honest unbelievers here. That, 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 that we have on most Sundays people here who are not yet Christians but are still checking it out. Good for you. We are so glad you're here and we so appreciate you doing this. But you need to know you can't ever stand before God and say, well, I just never got it. Because when you see him, as Paul's saying to these guys, you chose to reject. You chose to reject what you heard. So please take that seriously. But also it's important we recognize this, okay? Look at verse 50. What happens? Oh, sorry. Look at verse 48. What happens? And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. In other words, ah, God's plan was for us to be a part of this. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Isn't that interesting? So it's important for us to recognize on one sense, on one hand, listen, individuals are personally responsible for rejecting God's gift in Jesus, but also no one chooses Jesus without God's initiating supernatural work. So this is one of the things that Christians divide over is how does that work? How does God's choice of people work with people's free will? How does that work? I don't know. I've been studying the Bible for 37 years. I don't know how that goes together, but I know both are true. And I want to hold both in tension. I don't want to exalt one at the expense of the other. I know that none of you are going to choose Jesus to follow Jesus, nor will I, unless God does a work in our hearts. But I also know you've got a choice to make, and so do I. So I'm going to believe for God's work. I'm going to pray. This is why if we're involved in the mission, we should be praying for God to change people's hearts because he's got to do a work to change people's hearts. And I'm going to give the invitation. I'm going to call people to believe. And in just a minute, I'm going to call you to believe. Look what happens in verse 50 to 52. It says, when the, but when the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leader, leading men of that city, they started up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook, dust, they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Here's what's happening. In spite of their leaders leaving, Paul and Barnabas getting kicked out of the, the place. And, and in spite of the fact that they, therefore, were probably also going to have potential persecution, these new believers joyfully press on by the power of God's indwelling spirit. Where's the follow-up team? Who's going to disciple these guys? Well, they're going to have to disciple one another. They're going to have to, 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 to get together, open the scriptures, pray, remember the Lord together. They're going to have to just do that. Because when we say just do that, because they can be confident and rejoice because God dwells in them by his Holy Spirit. God's going to do the follow-up. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do follow-up. I'm not saying that when people come to faith, we shouldn't be intentional about discipling. Of course, we need to do that. But what I'm saying to you, listen, listen is this. The gospel spreads and disciples are empowered by the Spirit. 
It's God who starts the work. It's God who will finish the work, which is what Paul writes about in Philippians 1.6. And I'll close with this verse. Listen. He says, am I certain and I am certain that God, who began that good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I want you guys to think about this as I get ready to pray. I want you to consider, could your lack of zeal for gathering together, you know what I'm talking about? That feeling you get on Sunday, like, oh, it's church. Could your lack of zeal for gathering together with God's people come from your laziness regarding his mission? You just don't really care that much about the fact that you're here to be equipped to reach lost people. Or apathy, you could say. Consider this. Could your lack of power from God's Holy Spirit be due to your, your neglect of prioritizing God's mission? We went through 1 Corinthians and people were getting excited. Yeah, we want to see God do supernatural gifts. We believe in supernatural gifts. Yeah, let's do it. But they're not toys. They're tools. And if you're not willing to build what God wants you to build, why would he give you the tools? And for those of you who are still wrestling with whether or not you want to be a Christian, could your hesitancy to follow Jesus really just be your sinful unwillingness to trust Jesus? That's kind of heavy, isn't it? I recognize it's heavy. But I, I, I mean this seriously. Have I said anything that isn't pretty clearly in this text? So I'm asking you a question. Have I said anything that's clearly in this, question, in this text? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Guys, God is doing an amazing work that cannot fail. Do you want to be a part of it? 